Good morning. So good to see everybody here this morning. Hope that you're doing well, having a great weekend and a great Lord's Day. It's good to have some back with us that have been out sick and having medical procedures. Glad that you're doing better and able to be back with us today. I want to um, make one correction um, that was in the bulletin, and it was my fault. I gave them the wrong date. Uh, the next area-wide singing is actually going to be on September the 7th at Portia. Uh, usually, due to the Labor Day holiday, it falls usually that first weekend of September, and so they skip it. Well, this time it actually falls earlier because uh, the month of September actually begins on a Sunday this year, and so that's kind of messed the schedule up a little bit in that regard. But the area-wide singing will be on September the 7th at Portia. And so if you want to uh, take note of that, I know some of you uh, generally try to attend that. Also, as we've mentioned, we need to keep all of our students, our teachers, our administrators, all of our school staff members in our prayers. I think most of our area schools are starting back this week. As well, we have four of our young people that are going to be in college. We need to remember all of them in our prayers. Uh, Hayden Bird is continuing uh, her education at Harding, Anna Billingsley at Freed Hardeman, and then Jessica and Jonathan Schultz will both be at Curley's Ridge College this fall. And so uh, we keep each one of them in our prayers and hope that all of our students and all of those who are involved in the education of our young people have a wonderful and blessed school year. Well, we're continuing our study of the book of Ephesians, noting the ways that the Apostle Paul reveals to us how we as Christians are stronger together. And as we continue this study, this morning we come to Ephesians chapter 5. And what we're going to note is that in the first two verses of this chapter, Paul is going to present to us a third way that we are to walk as God's children according to the standard that God has set forth. In those two verses it says, Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Now Paul tells us that at one time, all of us who are children of God today, we once walked according to the standard of our old way of life. We walked according to the ways of the world, following after the devil. As we're told in Ephesians 2 and verse 2, during that time we were considered children of disobedience rather than children of God. But now we have a new name. We've been adopted into the family of God. And as such, we are to take on our new family's way of life. Just as we see children imitating their parents. You know, it's always kind of comical whenever you will see some of the things that young people will start to do. That you look at them and you see aspects of their parents starting to to come out in them, from the things that they say, the, the, the kinds of phrasing that they use, even to the way that they walk and stand and carry themselves. They are watching their parents and they are imitating the things that they see in them. Well, just as little children imitate their parents and strive to be like them, we are to imitate our Heavenly Father, the patriarch of this new family unit that we are a part of. We're to watch him. We're to learn of his ways. We're to follow the behaviors that we see being set forth. Back in 2015, and I may not pronounce this name right, but there was a man by the name of Julius Yingo. Julius, I'll just call him Julius, he was from the country of Kenya, and he shocked the world in the Olympic Games when he won the gold medal for the javelin throw. Now that in and of itself is an amazing feat, someone to, to excel to that extent in their sport. 
But what made Julius so impressive is the fact that he had no formal training. He had never worked with a coach. He had never trained with any former Olympians. In fact, the first competition that he was ever in was the qualifiers for the Olympic Games. So how did he learn uh, to to toss this javelin in such a powerful way? He was self-taught. He got on the internet, he went to YouTube, and he watched former Olympic javelin victors. And through the years, as he was training himself, he would imitate their movements, he would imitate their techniques until he had honed his skill into that of a champion. Well, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 2 tells us that we too have a role model that we are to be looking to, one that we are to be patterning ourselves after, one that we are to be grooming ourselves according to the way that this role model lived his life. Well, Paul tells us that that role model is Christ. Christ being our perfect example. Christ being the perfect image of God. The kind of son that God wants us to be. We look at the way that Jesus lived his life and we strive to live our life according to that standard. By doing that, we will be pleasing to God. Our life will be one that is a pleasing aroma to God. If we go back into the Old Testament, we see that the execution of those sacrifices that were required to be offered is described as a sweet-smelling savor arising to God. Well, when we as children of God live a life that is sacrificial, we live a life of love, we live a life of devotion to God, our life is a sweet-smelling savor to God, just as those sacrifices were. But we find that as Paul explains what it means to imitate God and to imitate his son, he's quick to point out that there are certain behaviors that the world tries to justify, that the world seems to think are perfectly acceptable, but they are things that we must not be deceived into believing are acceptable to God. And he does this from the standpoint of behaviors that many people believe equate to love. And you notice the examples that he gives in verses 3 through 5. He says, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, or covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So notice in these verses, Paul mentions three sins. He mentions sexual immorality, impurity, and covetousness. Now in the context, we find that he is using all of these as a contrast to the true love of God. These are things that people in the world look at and and consider many of these as forms of loving behavior. But in talking about sexual immorality, we recognize that this is any type of sexual relationship outside of a scriptural marriage. Impurity, one of the most simple and, and best definitions that I could give for this, impurity is anything that is dirty. How many times do we hear people say that someone has a dirty mind or someone has a dirty mouth? What does that mean? It means that they are filling their mind or they're filling their speech with things that are inappropriate. Things that are not portraying the love of Christ. But then he also mentions covetousness. Some translations will use the word greed in this passage. Simply put, this is the desire for something that we have no right to have. While this can be used in reference to any number of things, money, possessions, we find that in this context, it's describing those kinds of relationships that 
people say are love. Those kinds of relationships that people desire to have, but they do not have the scriptural right to have. Well, then as we come into verse 4, we find matching with these three sins of sexual immorality, impurity, and covetousness, we find Paul listing three types of speech that are unloving. Three types of speech that are to be avoided. He mentions filthiness, foolish talking, and crude joking or crude jesting. But we need to establish this from the outset. What is it that makes a person's speech filthy, foolish, or crude? Is it the tone of their voice? No. A person can be very loving, but naturally have a gruff voice. It's the content of their speech. The things that they allow to come forth from their mouth. And in the context that we're seeing here, this is talking about these illicit ideas of what is love. So whenever we think about this concept, how would this apply? Well, it's talking about things such as dirty jokes, innuendos, suggestive language, making light of things that are sinful. And acting as if they are perfectly acceptable. So instead of looking at and thinking about the things that we're not allowed to have. The things that we are not allowed to take part in. We're told that in everything we are to be giving praise to God. We are to be doing those things, living our life in such a way. That we are displaying the love of God, this true love that we are to have for God and for our fellow man, and also praising Him for what He has given us. But notice that Paul, in this passage, he talks about the fact that those who live lives devoted to these false forms of love, those things really become an idol in their life. Because they are devoting themselves to those things that are contrary to the will of God. And what's taking place, we see this in every form of idolatry from bowing down to graven images to placing undue emphasis upon things of this life. We see that it is exchanging the Creator for the creation. Rather than praising and thanking God and serving Him, we're giving our devotion to things that are contrary to our Creator. And really all of this stems from being unthankful. Not being appreciative to God for the things that He has blessed us with. In Romans 1 and verse 21, Paul says, Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And so if we are not thanking God and glorifying God in our marriage, Or for those who have chosen not to marry, if they are not praising and glorifying God by finding fulfillment in life outside of that type of relationship, then you need to understand that you are on a road to sinful living. You're not living life the way that you should. You are living a life that is devoid of true love. Hence we find Paul's warning there in chapter 5 and verse 6 of Ephesians. He says, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Now I want you to stop with me for just a minute and think about the world around us. Think about all of the different ways that we see this word love being used. How many of those ways are truly indicative of real, genuine love? Very, very few. How many of those types, uh, or how many times do we see people using this term love to refer to things that are blatantly sinful? Many, many times. 
You know, one of the main slogans that we see promoting the homosexual lifestyle today is love is love. Well, by this, what they are implying is that regardless of how you interpret this word love and the concept of love, that it's to be respected and considered as equal. But what this is implying is that love is nothing more than a physical relationship. Love is nothing more than a physical act. And brothers and sisters and friends, that is a very shallow way of looking at love. In fact, it is not a proper way of looking at love at all. What it is, it's an attempt to legitimize sinful behaviors. Well, if it's something that I love, it must be acceptable. If it's something that I love, that that brings me joy and, and brings me fulfillment in life, it must be okay for me to do this. But folks, as much as man may want to make sin legitimate, Paul is very clear. Whenever he says in verse 6, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Now that doesn't sit very well with most people. With many people, the mentality is, you know what, this body belongs to me and I can do with it whatever I want. I can use it for whatever activity I want to engage in. But I want you to go back and remember the context that Paul is expressing these teachings in. He's talking about how we are to imitate God. How we are to live godly lives. And folks, God is nothing like these sinful behaviors. The love that God has for each and every one of us is nothing like the worldly ways that we see this word love being used. But now I want to jump ahead just a little bit. We're going to stay in Ephesians chapter 5, but let's skip down to verses 31 and 32. Here Paul discusses what a proper loving relationship is supposed to be like. He says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now if you read the verses just prior to this, we find that Paul goes into detail talking about the responsibilities of husbands and wives. But now in summing all of this up, notice that he drops a quote from the book of Genesis, going all the way back to the very beginning, talking about the fact when Adam and Eve were joined together, when God gave Eve to Adam as a mate, what does it say? The two became one flesh. Folks, what that means is that in marriage, the old family unit is left behind. That family unit where we were children in the home of our parents, that's left behind. We leave our parents and we cleave to our spouse. We become a new family unit. But notice what Paul goes on to say. He says this is a picture of what it's like in the church. Before you came to Christ, when you were a part of your old family unit, you were a child of disobedience. You were living according to the ways of your father, the devil. But when you became a child of God, when you came to Christ and were were added by Him to His body, the church, guess what? You're now a part of a new family unit. We are joined to Christ. He is our groom. We are His bride. So what he's telling us is that our marriages are to be pictures of the faithfulness that God has shown to us. 
Now let me ask you this question. These sinful behaviors that Paul has listed, that we've looked at this morning, when you think about those things, do you see a picture of God's commitment to us? No. Those sinful behaviors that we discussed, fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, filthiness, foolish talking, coarse jesting, does that describe the kind of love that God has for you and me? No, absolutely not. Does that paint a picture of the kind of love that we are to have for God and for our fellow man? No. Do those things, when we hear about that, does it remind us of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross? No. What this is showing us is that those kinds of behaviors are not conducive to living a faithful Christian life. Those are things that are a part of our old way of life. Things that are supposed to have been turned away from. Well, that's the false view of walking in love. You may remember at the beginning of the lesson, I stated that Paul shows us two images here, two pictures, two things. Well, first off, he shows us a negative view, a false view of what it means to walk in love as children of light. But also, he's going to show us a positive view of what it really means to walk in love as children of light. Well, let's back up. Go back to verses 7 through 10. Paul says, Therefore, do not be partakers with them, for you were once darkness. He's talking about past tense. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. So now Paul has presented a negative view. He says, you know, those things are a part of the old way of life. Leave those things there. He says, but now, now you are light. Now you are to be walking as children of light. No longer wandering around in darkness. No longer spreading that type of lifestyle around. But you are to be exuding goodness and righteousness and truth. But we need to recognize this fact. Simply turning away from sin is not enough. Simply saying, okay, I, I'm going to stop living this way. That's not enough. We're not going to be pleasing to God if we just stand still. Notice in each of these instances there's action. It talks about walking after. Pursuing. Well, we were pursuing a life of ungodliness. We have to stop that and start walking in light as children of light. As children of light, we continue to walk. But notice that Paul says that we are to do this in a way that pleases God. But notice that he says that we do this in a way that it exposes the darkness around us. In verses 11 and 12 it says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. Now it's easy for us to read this passage and come away with the mindset that we as children of God are to go out into the world and point a condemning finger at every person that's in sin. That is not what this is saying at all. Now granted, there are times and there are situations where public confrontation has to take place. But it is never to be done so in such a way that it is unkind unloving and divisive. What Paul is saying here is that what is to be exposed is not the people but the deeds. Like we've always said, we are to hate the sin but love the sinner. We speak out against those sinful deeds. We allow the Word of God to be what condemns those sins. But we continue to display love for the individual. 
And the reason for that is because our desire is not to drive them away. Our desire is to bring them as well into the light. To open their eyes to their sinful condition, to those things in life that need to be changed so that they will come to live a life of faithfulness to God. Well, how do we do this? Well, Paul says we do this by exposing their false ways. But notice he says the way that we do this is by showing them the true love of Christ. We go out into the world. We live a faithful Christian life. We display the love of God to every person that we come into contact with. In doing that, people are going to realize, you know, there's something different about this person. When they come around, they're always positive. There's always something that exuding from them, a goodness, a righteousness that exudes from them. But what Paul is saying is that they're going to see the way that we're living our life and the things that we are abstaining from, and that's going to open their eyes to the sinful things that are in their life, the things that need to be changed. And so what we find is that we are not exposing people with the purpose of shaming them or or mocking them or driving them away. We're exposing their deeds as an act of love. We want them to recognize the things that are in their life that need to be changed. Bringing them to the true love of Christ. Well, Ephesians 5, verses 13 and 14. It says, But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Simply put, what Paul is saying in this passage is that when we shine the light of God from our life, people are finally going to be able to see the things that are in their life. Those things that are hidden by the darkness of sin are going to be exposed. They're going to recognize the things that are there. They're going to look at those things that that they consider loving and acceptable, and they're going to see how that contrasts with what God says is loving and acceptable. And they're going to come to shine forth light as well. What we find, Paul uses a passage from the book of Isaiah to support this. In Isaiah 60, verses 1 through 3, it says, Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and His glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. This is a prophecy pertaining to Christians. This is a prophecy pertaining to you and I, and we see its fulfillment each and every day. When we see that transformation that takes place in the lives of children of God as they turn away from the darkness and they come to the light and they begin to shine forth that light to the world as Jesus commanded to let that light so shine. Is it true that darkness covers the earth? Sure. Everywhere we look we see the darkness of sin. But as Isaiah says, those who are faithful children of God, the light of God is going to shine upon us. And that light is going to radiate from our lives. As our lives are transformed, people are going to look at us and guess what they're going to see? They're no longer going to see our old way of life. They're going to see the light of the love of God coming forth from us. And many of them are going to be led to see that light, to declare His glory, to come to Him. Now tying all of this together with our overall theme of how we are stronger together, I want you to think with me for just a moment. 
when we as children of God all shining forth the radiance of God's goodness and love in our lives are bound together in love presenting this united front to the world think about the magnitude of that light You know, just one light dispels a little bit of darkness, but a lot of lights dispel a lot of darkness. We're stronger together because we are displaying even more powerfully the love of God. And so as Paul is telling us here, we need to go and we need to shine that light. We need to be letting that light so shine before others that they may see the love of God in us, that they may see the transforming power of the gospel in our life, that they may recognize the things that are in their life that need to be corrected so that they too may come to have that change in their life that comes from obeying the gospel and living faithfully. And they too begin to shine forth as children of light. Now this morning there may be someone here and you realize that as a child of God, Maybe you've not been shining that light. Maybe you've let that light of Christian influence go out. Or maybe, uh, as Jesus talked about, maybe you've hidden that light under a bowl. You don't let that influence out. Well, my encouragement to you this morning is start shining that light to the world. Relight that fire. Take it out from under that bowl. Let it shine forth to the world. Begin having that strong impact upon those around you. Or if there is someone who is not a child of God and you've never begun shining that light, then I encourage you this morning, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, repent of your sins. Come forward, confess the faith you have in Christ and be baptized. The Lord will add you to the church. You'll be bound together in Christ's body. And you can begin shining forth that light of influence. This morning, if you examine yourself and you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, we encourage you to come while we stand and sing.